thesis under the supervision of Professor Robert Brody, and his MA thesis is devoted to Rav Shmuel Ben Hof Nigaon's legal monographs, Kitab El Rahim. And the second uh, speaker is Svi Stamper, a uh, uh, skillful organi organizing uh, this conference. He's a lecturer and research associate at the Hebrew University. Dr. Stamper studies the relations between theology and law in the Judeo Islamic milieu. And the third uh, speaker is Phil Ackerman Lieberman from uh, Vanderbilt University, the Associate Professor of Jewish Studies and Law, Associate Professor of Religious Studies, and Affiliate Associate Professor of Islamic Studies and History at University. He's a social, economic, and legal historian of Jewish life in the medieval Islamic world. His current book project examines uh, Jewish urbanization under the early Abbasids and subsequent migration of these Jews to the Islamic Mediterranean. And he's currently preparing a translation of a Moines Guide to the uh, Perplexed with Len Goodman to be published by Stanford University Press in 2018. Very interesting. And uh, we start uh, with Daniel uh, Kane. Uh, each and every speaker has 20 minutes. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> This lecture will deal with a halachic text that discusses two Talmudic passages, interprets them, and determines the halachai discusses, while implementing source, uh, concepts from the world of Aristotelian logic into the halachic discourse. Over the course of this presentation, I will attempt to clarify the precise meaning and full implications of these foreign concepts, examine the way in which they are integrated into the halachic discussion, and finally, offer a possible explanation for the somewhat unusual way in which the halakhic discussion was shaped. The halakhic issue under discussion is the possibility of combining partially contradictory t testimonies in court. The halakhic text we will examine is Rav Haigon's The Laws of Oaths, which Patesh worked. Let us start with reading the Talmudic sources uh, that uh, Rav Haigon's text is based upon. Sources number one, two, and three in the Hannah. The first, Babylonian Talmud, practice and Hadrin, page 38. Never can the testimonies of two witnesses be combined unless both witness the event together. Rabbi Yosho ben Kocha said, even if they witnessed it one after the other, it, it is admissible, and again, their testimony is not admissible in the court unless they both testify together. <coughs> in this Baraita, the sages examined the option of combining separate testimonies of two single witnesses from different times of the same legal event, with the intention of combining them into a single admissible testimony. The Talmudic discussion based upon this, uh, upon this writer, source number two, goes one step further and examines the poss uh, possibility of combining partially contradicting testimonies of the same event by isolating the common denominator they share and disregarding the controversial elements of both testimonies. Source number two, Babylonian Talmud practice and headline page 30b. The Nihardians said, whether it is a case of an admission after an admission, an admission after a loan, a loan after a loan, or a loan after an admission, the testimonies may be combined. With whom does this, does this opinion agree? With Rabbi Yoshua and Kocha. Rabbi Huda said, a testimony that is considered contradictory in examinations is valid in monetary cases. Rava said, Rabbi Huda's ruling is acceptable where one witness says a black purse and the other says a white purse. But if one says a black money, which is a kind of coin, and the other says a white money, their testimonies cannot be combined. The examinations mentioned in the source are a process of, so of cross-examining witnesses by focusing on the minor and marginal details of the event. If the two witnesses do not agree on these details, their testimony is null and void. Rav Yehuda argues that this process should be applied only in testimonies this, uh, uh, regarding capital offenses, and that contradictory testimonies of that kind are perfectly valid in matters of civil law. Rav agrees with him only up to a certain degree of contradiction, and not beyond it. And I carry on with this sugiya. Rav Shimon ben Elazar said, Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel do not differ with respect to two sets of witnesses, of which one attests to 200 zuz and the other to a mané, which equals 100 zuz, since a mané, 100, is included in 200. They differ only where there is but one set of witnesses. Beit Shammai says, uh, 
Beit Shammai say that their testimony is split. And Beit Hillel say 200 include a maneh, 100. If one witness says a barrel of wine and, and the other says a barrel of oil, such a case happened and it was brought before Rabbi Ami, who ordered him, the defendant, to repay the value of barrel of wine out of the barrel of oil. In accordance with whom, this opinion? With Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar. One can argue that Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar ruled so where, where 200 include a maneh. But did he also rule us in such a case as this? It, Rabbi Amr saying, was the price of the value of wine and oil. <clears throat> At this stage of the sugya, we learn that the disagreement over the amount of debt is not considered a fundamental disagreement, and that we can view the two testimonies as agreeing on the lower sum. On the other hand, the dispute about the nature of the goods of the parties traded in is significant and renders the two testimonies void. <clears throat> in an analysis of the Talmudic discussion, we can say that it differentiates between contradictions between testimonies that invalidate testimony and contradictions that can be dealt with by isolating a common denominator and acting upon it in court. The rationale of this distinction is not well defined, but it seems to be quantitative and not substantive, i.e. a distinction between serious contradiction and a minor one. The second Talmudic sugya that is referred to in Haigon's discussion is a sugya in Tractate Ketubot, 19b, which is concerned with the question of witnesses verifying their signature on a deed, source number three. One witness says there is a stipulation, and one witness says there is no stipulation. Our Papa said both of them are testifying on a valid deed, and the one who says that there is a stipulation is alone, and the words of one have no value where there are two. Rav Huna, son of, of, son of Rav Yoshua, said, if so, then both of them also cannot testify on a stipulation. But we say that they are coming to approve their testimony, and so, to, so too he is coming to approve his testimony. And the halakha is according to Rav Huna, son of Rav Yoshua. This Talmudic discussion is about a case of two witnesses signed on a deed, one of whom, while verifying his signature, says that the parties <coughs> added a stipulation to the deed without adding it in writing. Rav Papa suggests dividing the testimony of, the witness, of a witness who says that there is a stipulation into two stages. The first stage is the testimony on the validity of the deed. And the second is the testimony on the external stipulation. On the basis of this division, Rav Papa suggests handling the contradicting testimonies in the same method we saw in the Sugan Sanhedrin, i.e by maintaining their common denominator, the validity of the deed. But Rav Huna son of Rav Yeshua, and the Talmudic sugya as well, reject this proposal on the grounds that the witness who testifies about the stipulation practically uproots his testimony. In other words, the witness actually says that the deed on which he signed has no validity until they fulfill the stipulation. And therefore, his testimony cannot be joined to the testimony that seeks to validate the deed. The Talmudic passage, it, a passage, it appears, rejects altogether the proposed legal mechanism we found in the Sugya and Sanhedrin, we read just before. And part of Rav Haigon's discussion will be devoted to resolving this contradiction. We will now discuss a passage from Rav Haigon's The Laws of Oaths, Mishpatei Shavuot, as part of the fifth chapter of the second part of the book, The Laws of Those Who Swear and Obtain, Haigon expands the scope of this halachic discussion and addresses issues concerning false witnesses and, uh, and contradicting testimonies, including the laws of combining contradictory testimonies. Please turn to source number four. But if only one, uh, two witnesses damn it, and they contradict each other, and one of the two said the debt is 100, and the other said 200, their testimony is not void because of its inner contradiction, but rather, the defendant is obliged to pay 100 dirham. And that is what, uh, what was agreed upon, as the sages said. And here he quotes the passage concerning the dispute of Beit Hirel and Beit Shammai about a maneh and 200, and concludes, and that is the contradiction in quantity. And they also said regarding the contradiction in essence, that the testimony is not deemed invalid due to it, but rather, the amount that is not under controversy will remain. And thus they said, and here he quotes the case of the broken barrel. 
And they said regarding the contradiction in quality, and here he quotes what we is saying about uh, contradictions in examinations, in capital cases, and monetary cases. And in the end of this, this discussion, and that is the case if the object under dispute can be divided in such a way that the testimonies of the two witnesses will partially agree, as in a case of contradiction in the, in the thing that the witnesses testified to. But if it is not possible to divide if the contradiction is in the purposes of the root of the testimony, such as when one witness says that, the, that his testimony was absolute and the other says that I testified under a stipulation, the testimonies cannot partially agree, but rather he, one of the parties, has to accept the stipulation or else the testimony will be void. As the sages said, and here the sugya concerning the very fine of the deed is quoted. Rav Hagon takes two fundamental steps in this, uh, in this passage. The first step is the classification and titling of three of the contradictions in testimonies listed in, in the Talmudic Sugya and Sanhedrin as contradictions in essence, or in Arabic, mahiya, quantity, kamiya, and quality, kaifiya. The second step <coughs> is the resolution of the apparent contradiction between the Sugya and Ketubot and the one in Sanhedrin by distinguishing between two types of contradictions, those that differ with regard to the thing the witnesses testified on, and those that differ regarding what I will suggest we should translate as the purpose of the root of the, root of the testimony, or in Arabic, ma'ani asr shahada The characterization of the contradictions in testimonies found in the sugiyah as contradictions in essence, quantity, and quality is undertaken according to the, uh, the ten categories of Aristotle. In his work, The Categories, Aristotle argues that everything can be described according to one of ten categories, which are derivatives of the questions that can be asked regarding it. Quantity and quality are the second and third categories on the list. The term essence, Mahia, is slightly more pro problematic because it is not part of the list of the ten categories, but rather translates another term from the metaphysical, metaphysics of Aristotle, Toti Einai which translates into Latin as essentia and, and into English as quiddity or essence. However, this term has a close and complex relationship with, uh, with the concept of substance, usia in Greek, translated, translated into Arabic as johar, which is the first of Aristotle's ten categories. In source number five, you can see an attempt by El Farabi to define the term essence and its relationships with substance. And in source number six, you can see an example of a similar use of these three terms, essence, quantity, and quality, as a tree of categories that describe the object of investigation, authored by Elmukamas, who was one of the first Jews to engage in Kalam. Haigon's second move in the passage we've read is to solve the contradiction which we have discussed above between the Sugyot in Sanhedrin and in Ketubot by distinguishing between contradictions regarding the thing the witnesses testified on and those regarding the purposes of the root of the testimony, Ma'ani Asr al-Shahada. The difference between the two types of contradiction, according to Rav Hai, lies in the possibility of dividing the focus of the controversy. In the term division, Paigon refers to the process by which we separate the different elements within the testimonies in order to isolate the agreed upon elements from the controversial elements. Um, <clears throat> and so, when there is a contradiction regarding the thing the witnesses testified on, the testimony can be divided, and this enables us to use the, the Talmudic solution to a contradiction between witnesses. However, when the, when the contradiction is in the purpose of the, of the root of the testimony, it is indivisible, and there is therefore no way to reconcile the testimony. But what is this purpose of the root of the testimony? This label is a vague concept because it is a compound of two terms, mana and asl, that can tolerate a wide range of different meanings in different fields, and I'm not familiar with an exact uh, parallel to this specific use of the term. Therefore, we must interpret the phrase according to the sugiya it is attached to, and keep in mind the immediate context in which it is mentioned. As laid out above, the sugiya in Kitubot rejects the reasonable possibility of joining two testimonies by dividing one of them into two logical steps, because of the, the goals of the, the two testimonies are contradictory. 
the intentionality component is emphasized here by the words in Aramaic ka'ate or in English he is coming to, which should be understood as his intent is to. Haigon compares the intentional aspect of the testimony uh, um, to the testifying on a thing, namely the role of testimony as a report on reality. Therefore, the purposes of the root of the testimony are its goals, i.e. the witness's pragmatic intent, or at least the testimony's direct outcome. Uh, the proposed division here is between two aspects of the act of the testimony, its informative aspect and its legal pragmatic aim. Having attempted to clarify Heigel's use of the philosophical terms and concepts in this section, one might ask, what has the discussion gained from the use of these concepts? As stated above, the term, the purposes of the root of the testimony, allows Heigel to resolve the conflict between two sugiyot. However, the classification of types of contradictions in testimony according to the Aristotelian categories does not respond to any obvious difficulty in the interpretation of the sugya. Actually, it creates one, but we, have, we don't have time to talk about it. Or in the determination of the halakha on this issue. <clears throat> I think we should see the classification of the contradictions not as a tool to distinguish between items within a group, but as a way to characterize the group as a whole. In other words, by assigning these titles to the different examples of contradictions in testimony, Haigon demonstrates that in all cases in which the Talmud allows the combination of contradicting testimonies, the contradiction is in the informative aspect of the testimony. After all, in a way you can say that the Aristotelian categories are a taxonomy of the ways in which one can describe things. In short, <coughs> Haigon shows that the the, the tolerable contradictions, according to the Talmud, in testimony, are those that concern the description of reality. The next step is a little more speculative, but I think it is important for the full understanding of Haigaon's words. The central statement of the section, according to the analysis offered here, is the claim that the testimony on things can be divided, but the witness's intentions cannot be divided. Haigaon does not offer a proof for this statement, and one could take it as axiomatic. Okay, great. But one proof that the testifying on things can be divided is present already in Heigel's text. Our very passage includes the division of the contradictions in testimonies according to Aristotelian categories. Indeed, the division by categories is not the same as the halachic division we find in the Talmud, as we explained in the book. But both sets of distinction Distinctions are a conceptual division of human utterance. And if one of them is possible, then most likely the latter is equally possible. According to this reading, the use of Aristotelian categories is, uh, in order to classify types of contradiction between testimonies is implemented in order to characterize the contradictions in two ways. First, it defines them as contradiction in the, in the description of reality. And second, it, uh, uh, and in addition, it reinforces the, uh, the claim that this aspect of the testimony can be further subdivided. Thus far, I have tried to demonstrate how the concepts borrowed from the, the world of Arab philosophy, Mahiya, Kaifiya, and Kamiya, found their way into Rav Haigon's halakhic discussion on the issue of combining contradicting testimonies. But what actually motivated him to do so? We could suggest that the question of contradicting testimonies strongly poses the problem of the relativity of truth. That is, the halachic system does not operate logically according to the consistent and well-defined standards for assessing truth. And still, one can argue that this is not the only halachic subject that poses some fundamental uh, questions that have philosophical implications. The answer to that challenge may be found in the very text that we have read. Haigon, as we can see from this text, implemented philosophical concepts and thinking methods associated with, with the analysis of speech and language. Implementing these thinking methods apparently spawned not only the solution he proposed, solutions he proposed, but also the very need for them. In other words, the sensitivity to, the sensitivity to philosophical problems related to testimonies generates the pursuit for, of conceptual consistency within the halakhic system and motivates the reader to reinterpret the uh, Talmudic sources accordingly. I thank you all for the attention, uh, for your attention. <laughs>
and uh, organizer of the conference for inviting me. And then. Uh, one minute before the time. Thank you.